Thank you, Johnny. Well, it's awesome to be here. It's so good to see you. It's great to see some familiar faces. Um, some from way back bumped into again. And um, talking to people before we got started, kind of getting a sense of what God is doing in people's lives and churches, but also a sense of some pain and some of the challenges of ministry and some of the disappointments have been in church life uh, in this area over the last 10 years or so. And uh, we, we, we live in that reality, don't we? That mixture of both joyful triumph and what God is doing, but sorrowful grieving at some of the, the losses and scars that we've had to endure as well. And that's part of the, the deal of, of Christian life and, and ministry. So wherever you are in that particular journey, trust me that today would be encouraging to you and, and would help you. Um, yeah, me, I am, uh, my name is Matthew Hosier. I am married to Grace. We have been married for 28 years. We have four now, adult daughters, my oldest daughter will be 25 in a couple of weeks' time, 23, she's getting married next year, that's our first marriage, um, 21, I think, and 18. So our youngest one's still at home, just in the last year at school, and will be leaving us. Uh, so we'll be in the empty nester season very soon. Um, been in full-time ministry for the past 27 years, been in my current setting for just coming up 15. I'm on in Paul, Bournemouth, right on the south coast of England. It's a church that was um, originally a Baptist church. We're still actually technically part of the Baptist Union. And uh, that church was started in the 1920s when that part of, of Paul was developed as, as, as uh, the town was expanding. And uh, that church then joined New Frontiers sometime in the 90s, I think. I moved down there January 2008. And uh, yeah, I've been part of the advanced story since that started. So it's been great to get to know Johnny and David over the last few years and to see what God is doing here, to make a couple of trips over here and really encouraged to be here this week. It's the great thing about being in, in Northern Ireland is the weather's always so fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've ever known a plane landing quite like it. When we came in on, on Wednesday morning, it was really windy, 50 mile per hour winds on Wednesday, and the plane was swerving as it came in and hit the deck so hard. It was really good fun. Some people were a little bit nervous, but I thought it was great. Okay. Dave has asked me to speak on the what and the why of partnership. The what and the why of partnership. Um, some people are naturally joiners. Some people like to join up to stuff. Maybe you're one of those people, maybe when you were a kid, you were the kid who joined up for everything. You joined up for the football team, you joined up for the scouts, you joined up for the cups, the brownies, whatever it was. You always wanted to join up to stuff. Other people aren't like that. Other people are more loners, tend not to be joiners in that kind of way. But biblically, the emphasis is always on we and together. And you see that right from the beginning of the story. So Genesis 2.18, God has created Adam. God looks at the man and says, it is not good for the man to be alone. And then God creates Eve to be with Adam to serve alongside him in the care and the stewardship of the earth. And of course, our normal way of reading that is the, the primary interpretation of that is in terms of God joining Adam and Eve together. We think of that in terms of marriage, which of course it is, the prototype archetype of what marriage should be, what it looks like. But it's much more than that. It's really about community. It's not good for man. Of course, Adam means man. It's not good for this man to be alone. And it's not good for man, the human race, to be alone. That these are people, and people are meant to be people together. You can't be a person in isolation, to be in isolation is actually to have a diminished personhood, full personhood, full peopleness can only experience, be experienced in community with others. And of course, the outflowing of God bringing Adam and Eve together is in an outflow of community because the commands to them and the blessing upon them immediately is go forth and multiply, fill the earth. The whole point is for them to produce community, a weeness, a togetherness. And from that point on, from then on, the story is always about community. It's always about we, us, together. And so we see God calling individuals. We see those moments when he reaches out and he takes hold of, of, an, of an Abraham. And then following a Abraham, he takes hold of the other patriarchs. Isaac and Jacob carry the promise of Abraham. But the purpose is always for community. So while God might choose a man, the point always is community. It's through your seed, you will bless. You'll be blessed and you'll be a blessing to the nations. The point is never that Abraham in solitary splendor experiences the blessing of God, but Abraham becomes the father of a nation which blesses the nations. That's the whole point. It's about community. It's about we, us, together. 
And we really don't see any lone range of figures in the Bible, certainly not voluntarily. Uh, one example which stands out is that of the prophet Elijah. We can sometimes think of prophets being rather solitary figures because of the kind of the ministry they have. But we see even with the case of the prophets, they were never meant to be alone and actually didn't want to be alone. That moment in 1 Kings 19 when Elijah is one of his, in one of his manic depressive episodes and he says to the Lord, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one. I'm alone. And there's that sense of bitterness in his soul because he feels alone. And what is the response of God? That I have 7,000 left in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You're not alone. You might feel alone, but you're not alone. You're not meant to be alone. This is always we, us, together. And when we get to the New Testament, we see the example, this, uh, this focus on, on togetherness very plainly. We see it, of course, in the ministry of Jesus with the three James, Peter, uh, John, with those closest to him, the 12, and then the 120. We see Jesus, although he would withdraw by himself to be with his father, he almost always was with other people, literally with other people. And we see that in the life of the Apostle Paul, that's one of the very striking things about Paul's letters and what we read in the book of Acts is that Paul is virtually never on his own. He is always in team. Think about that scripture where he talks about, I, I went there and I was unhappy. I, I couldn't rest because I couldn't find Titus. That says, I, I need to be with my friends. I need my companions. I need to be in partnership. So that very strongly in his, in his ministry. Think about some of the um, model churches of the New Testament, the churches of Antioch and Jerusalem, particularly those two model churches where we see in both those churches there are large teams operating together and then those churches help one another there's a partnership between the churches and then the, the apostle paul makes this explicit in the the uh, verses i want to build us around philippians paul says to the philippians philippians 1 verse 3 paul writes to the church in philippi i thank my god in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now see what Paul says. What Paul is doing here, which he does in most of his letters, it's only in Galatians and 2 Corinthians that Paul doesn't begin the letter with a prayer of thanks for the church he's writing to. And that's because there are particular issues in, in the church of Galatia and Corinth. Normally he starts his letter with a prayer of thanks. And the thing he prays thanks to God for about the church in Philippi is their partnership in the gospel. It's their partnership which brings Paul joy. It's their partnership that gives him confidence that the work will be completed. And there is something here which is much more profound, much more beautiful, much more meaningful than simply some kind of denominational alliance. It's much more than that. It, and, it, and it's more, I think, even something more powerful than, than just friendship in itself, although that is good. What we're seeing here in the way that Paul prays for the Philippians is something which is genuine and life-giving and mission-accomplishing. That their partnership in the gospel is joy-bringing and mission-making. That's why partnership is powerful. Let me tell you something of my personal story, my personal journey. My dad was a Baptist minister. He uh, went the conventional route for Baptist ministers of his era, late 60s in, in England. Went to Spurgeon's College, uh, took on the pastorate of a small little church in Southampton where I was born and uh, was there for a few years and then <clears throat> moved to another church in Kent. And during that time in the 70s, uh, dad got caught up in the charismatic renewal. Yeah. And of course, they want to assume that people know all the history of what's happened in the church in the UK over the last 50 years, but this uh, amazing move of God in the 70s, which in many ways actually started with the Anglican Church uh, through the ministry of David Watson and others, David Watson from York uh, in the UK, and uh, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a fresh way, and my dad got caught up in that somehow, and that was transforming for him, and, and he and others who were going through that experience discovered rediscovered values that became very shaping then in terms of how they thought about how church life should operate and what partnership in the gospel would look like. And some of the key things which were rediscovered at the moment were these. First of all, the thing, place where it all started was the personal experience of the Holy Spirit 
an experience of the Holy Spirit which is more than just a, an awareness that God somehow is in us by his Holy Spirit, but a genuine experience of the presence of the Spirit and of the power of the Spirit, of the fruit of the Spirit and of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And of course, that's what became hugely controversial for a whole number of years, uh, caused great actually divisions in the church as there are many arguments about the gifts of the Holy Spirit particularly. As a, a bit of an aside, when my, obviously it's before my memory, but when my dad got caught up in this, he, he spontaneously started to speak in tongues, which was just completely bizarre. And he didn't know what was going on. And, um, and this is ancient history, this is the 1970s. So he, he had, had a, a reel-to-reel tape recorder. Probably not many of you are old enough to remember those. Uh, really ancient technology. And he recorded himself speaking in tongues and then played it to my mum and said, what do you think is about this? <laughs> Just kind of so amazed at what was happening, mystified by it all. But anyway, this experience, personal experience of the Holy Spirit. What did she say? What did she say? Well, she got put up in as well, so it was, it was, it was all good. <laughs> the presence of the power, the fruit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Something which then flew out of that was understanding church leadership in terms of an elder team. That where dad had been and so many of his generation had been was a, the model was a solo pastor and especially in the Baptist world and some of you are familiar with this, a solo pastor and a board of deacons and often actually a hostile board of deacons, a board of deacons who'd been there forever and would be there forever and knew the pastor would not be and they were the ones who really controlled the church and there was often great, well, great damage done to pastors in that kind of setting and this rediscovery that church leadership shouldn't be like that. And it shouldn't be a solo pastor trying to do it all, all in himself. There should be a body of men, a band of brothers, a group of elders who together pastor, father, love, serve, shepherd, care for the flock that Christ has entrusted to them. And then the thing that then flew out of that was a recognition and reception of the Ephesians for gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And recognizing that God gives these gifts to the church for the strengthening of the church, so that the church might grow into unity and maturity. And that experience, which was very personal in our family, brought us, brought me, into a wider world. Suddenly our church began to change. That where previously there'd been the globe map up on a wall somewhere with little bits of wool and drawing pins to where some missionaries we had a big connection with were, suddenly that changed. Suddenly we were brought into meaningful relationship, into genuine partnership with other churches, with meaningful mission, both locally where we were and to the ends of the earth. And suddenly there were gifts who were coming into our church to strengthen us. There were men who did carry apostolic and prophetic and evangelistic gifting who were suddenly coming in, being invited in and imparting things to the congregation which helped strengthen us and bring us to maturity. And there was a sense of family which was beyond the local church, a sense that we are in genuine partnership with others on a mission together. And this, this wasn't just about a denominational structure, but was something which was truly, genuinely life-giving. And that we were following and receiving leadership that was not so much about structure, but was about a recognition of gift and fruit. That leadership now was leadership of influence rather than position. That those who were bringing in, uh, leadership into church life were those who were actually gifted and fruitful in it, not people who'd simply climbed some greasy ecclesiastical pole to get where they were in the denominational structures. So that is my personal history. I know for many of you, your personal history would be very different from that. That's, that's my personal story. And I think what that did for me, it gave me a vision of the church and what the church could be. And it also has meant that doing ministry without meaningful partnership is just unthinkable for me, completely unthinkable. And so for me to prioritise relationship with other leaders and other churches is absolutely essential. That's why I spent four days here this week rather than back home at my church, because prioritising relationship with other leaders and other churches is just absolutely central to who I am and what I do and what our church is caught up for. And that operates at different levels. So in the town army, and one of the real joys of the last five or so years in, in Paul and Bournemouth 
has been a much greater degree of friendship and relationship between a whole bunch of pastors in the town. And rather than just a rather dry fraternal that some of us used to reluctantly go to at times, we, there's a bunch of us who meet regularly and it is genuinely life-giving. And that's, that's beautiful. And I'm so grateful for that. But I know I need something which is more than just that. I need brothers with whom there is a real sense of alignment and priority where there is genuine partnership. Where, so it's great to be with the other pastors in Bournemouth with whom I have real friendship, but in this partnership which we call Advance, there's something more because there's a closer alignment, a shared priority, a genuine partnership. Mm. And, and my hunch is that most of us intuitively know that we need these kind of relationships and actually we, we want it. And uh, I guess that's why most of you are here this morning because we know we need this stuff. That's what we're looking for. So what, what practically does this kind of partnership mean? Let me try and put some flesh on the bones. For us in advance, there are four things particularly that we focus our partnership around, which gives some definition, some structure to what we're trying to do. The first thing is that we partner around having similar doctrine and values. Now, uh, we're not theology Taliban uh, in advance. We don't uh, seek to dot every I and cross every T in terms of people's theology, but we have, we have broad alignment in terms of our theology and, and values. So theologically, we are broadly reformed. We believe in the priority of God's action in saving and rescuing us. We, and this is the real life wire in so many con- rail in so many contexts at the moment, we, are, we, are com- we believe in complementarity. We believe men and women are equal, but different. And that means that some of the, the ways in which we serve before the Lord also are different. The key thing there for us is that we uh, believe in elder-led churches and that elders are men. We see that in scripture, that God appoints men, fathers, to serve in the church, to shepherd and care for the flock. Uh, and that's, that's an important thing for us and that is something which actually increasingly distinguishes us from so many others. It what distinguishes my church from some of my friends in Bournemouth who would have a different view of these things with whom we still partner locally but there isn't this would be one of those areas where there would be a different, different emphasis and some different outworkings. We are, we are elder-led, so we want everybody to take part. We believe church is family life. Everybody has a role to play. Everybody has a place at the table. Everybody has a contribution to make, but God does appoint elders, fathers in the church who have a responsibility before God to lead and care for the flock. We are spirit-empowered. We are looking still for that genuine experience of the presence, the power, the fruit, the gifts of the Spirit amongst us. We have a focus upon being disciple-making. We do want to make disciples, those who are genuinely pursuing Christ and becoming more and more Christ-like. We, we are, we are gospel-centered. We believe the gospel is how you get into relationship with God and how you stay in relationship with God. And so when we preach, we preach to saint and sinner to respond to the gospel. We need to keep coming back to the gospel. And we are mission focused. We don't want to be introspective. We're called, we believe, to go to the ends of the earth with the good news of Jesus Christ. We have these shared doctrine and values. We then secondly do have shared mission. That's what's on these rollerback banners. We plant and strengthen churches. That's our very easy to remember, very simple definition of what we're about. What is Advance about? We want to plant churches and we want to strengthen churches. That, that's the mission we believe God has called us to. Paul says to the Philippians here, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We're looking for God to bring some completion to our work that we plant and strengthen churches. The third thing we plant around is genuine relationship. Now, this is really important. The, the people that I'm doing ministry with are not people I'm doing ministry with just because I have to. <clears throat> The people I'm doing ministry with, I'm doing ministry with because I want to, and it's life-giving. So when we were together, as Johnny said, Wednesday and Thursday this week, uh, 15, 16 of us pastors from around the UK gathered together. We're together because we want to be, not because we have to be, not because there's a denominational diktat from headquarters which says you have to be at this. No, there's a, a sense of brotherhood, genuine love, concern, care, friendship for one another. 
And also, part of that is a high priority to have fun. So that is a characteristic of advanced life, that we want to have fun together. And if, when people like me go into our church as if it feels that things are perhaps a little bit dour, a bit serious in our churches, one of the things we want to do is encourage eldership teams to inject a greater sense of fun. Uh, I've just, I just picked up um, C.S. Lewis's The Screw Tape Letters. Uh, Jacob brought me in this morning, so we drove past where C.S. Lewis was born. We'd gone past it, which, if I'd known, we'd have stopped and I could have paid due homage. But I haven't, I haven't read it for 20 or 30 years. And uh, just reading that last night, and he talked to there, you know, the senior devil advising the younger devil about how to lure this person into, away from God. He talks about how the, da- the danger of fun because actually fun is given, he talks, by the enemy, by God. It's a good, because fun is closely aligned to joy. And joy only comes from God. It can never come from yeah. the pit. And so we do, we do have a high priority on, on fun in advance that we want, to enjoy. we want to enjoy being together. And the fourth thing we partner around is what we describe as suitably gifted leadership, that we do want our churches to be helped by those who are qualified to help them. So those who are recognised as gifted and fruitful to come amongst us to help equip us that we might grow in unity and maturity in the faith. A lot of that actually happens in terms of church-to-church strengthening. It's a particular emphasis for us that it's not just about somebody like me coming into a church, but we're looking for churches to help strengthen other churches. And I know in your context, Johnny and Dave, your two churches help strengthen one another. We're looking for that. We're looking for a really a brotherly attitude amongst one another, that brothers help one another. Um, and it's beautiful to see that when that happens. So the, these four things, similar, shared doctrine and values, shared mission, genuine relationship, <coughs> recognition of suitably gifted leadership, these four things are what create the, the culture or the kind of feel of what advance is and they, and they help orientate what we're doing. That's some, 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 some of the what of our partnership. Now, coming back to the, the why of partnership. Why should we partner together? Well, the starting point is this biblical conviction that this is what God intends for us. This is, this is what God has for us, that we're not meant to be alone. We're meant to be in community with others. And as churches, we shouldn't be alone. Our churches shouldn't exist in splendid isolation. Our churches need to be caught up in a partnership with others in mission together. So there's that biblical conviction the second reason, especially for those who are called to, to full-time ministry, is the reality that ministry is hard. Now, it's not hard in the way that going and digging roads or something is hard, but there is a, a, a demand upon those who are called to minister to the gospel. There's a constant spiritual fight. It's demanding. And especially the last few years, all we've gone through has been especially demanding for pastors. And there are too many lonely pastors and there are too many pastors who burn out and give up. And, and we want to avoid that and fight that as much as we possibly can. And I know myself, the times I've been right tottering on the edge at that point of giving up, burning out, flaking out. It has been my partnership with my brothers which has so often pulled me back from the edge. Because it's been my brothers who've given me courage and spoken joy and given me some fun. I think last year was probably in 27 years of full-time ministry. Last year was, I think, the toughest year I'd gone through personally, a whole number of reasons. And I was really seriously low at some points. And then uh, it, was, it was really um, a meeting of, of the advanced global team where a couple of the guys kind of got me spiritually by the scruff of the neck and pulled me out of that place. And I think a year on, I haven't, haven't, gone, haven't been back where I was in terms of how bad things were because my brothers lifted me up. We need that. We need that. It should happen within our churches, in our churches, but sometimes you need brothers outside your church who can help do that as well. Now, there are lots of places that we can get resources. I mean, especially today, there's so much good resource. You just go on the internet, you can... World-class teaching, brilliant input. It's all there. And there are loads of good initiatives you can give your cash to, and that's good. And there are lots of excellent ministries that we can bless and we should bless. But I think we need more than that. We need more than just going onto the internet and getting the best sermons. And we need more than just giving our money to some good ministries and initiatives. What we need is genuine partnership. 
Um, this church in Philippi is a great example of that. It was the, it was the first church in Europe. You know the story? Uh, Paul's ministry, the church has been an Asian church. There's been a little offshoot into Africa, the Ethiopian eunuch has met with Jesus. Presumably he went back to Ethiopia and started to share the good news there. But the gospel had been in Asia and a little bit into Africa. And then Paul has this vision, the man of Macedonia saying, come and help us. And he and his friends, always are friends, always partnership, hop in a boat, sail across, end up in Philippi. Lydia becomes the first convert in Europe. Churches start to make that amazing Philippian story. It's those three amazing encounters. Lydia, first convert, the demon-possessed girl set free, and the, and the Philippian jailer. What an awesome story those three stories are. Church started, first church in Europe. And then the church in Philippi and the other Macedonian churches, the church in Thessalonica and Berea, become a model of what church life and partnership is meant to look like. And so Paul writes to the church in Philippi and says, your partnership with me in the gospel is what has given me, with me, given me joy. And then Paul writes to the church in Corinth about the Macedonian churches and quotes them as an example. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Now, it's a really interesting little window into Macedonian church life, what the church at Philippi and Thessalonica and and Berea were like. These were model churches of Macedonian churches, and when Paul is wanting the Corinthians to up their game, he points them in the direction of the Macedonians, and says, look at these guys. These are the guys who Paul has said, you bring me joy because of your partnership in the gospel, and these are the guys who, out of their overwhelming poverty, are still overflowing with generosity, which comes from joy. These, the church in Philippi had a re reputation for joy. Now, that's the kind of partnership which I aspire to. And we aspire to, where there's that kind of lived experience of joy in the Lord, which results in blessing to church after church and context after context in a wide geographical area. That's the kind of partnership I aspire to. When we had our advanced global conference in May in Bournemouth, we, we got a, a picture of some of that as uh, several hundred of us gathered together and people from around the world and people from very different contexts, very different economic and cultural contexts, and this beautiful picture of genuine partnership in the gospel, a real sense of joy in the Lord and helping one another forward. That's the kind of thing that we desire, seek after, want to be part of. Now, partnership isn't always easy. Any kind of partnership at times always has challenges. Those of you who are married, the most basic unit of partnership, you'll know this. Marriage is beautiful, good wonderful, but also often full of challenge. Partnership is not always easy, but we believe we need it and it's worth fighting for and it is worth investing in. Now, those of you who are from Foundation Church in the way, I particularly want to just speak to you because obviously you, you're the guys who are part of our advanced partnership already. I, I hope even as I'm speaking that you're recognizing some of what I'm talking about that you already feel some of the benefits of partnership which I'm, I'm just describing. I hope at the least you'll see the benefit of partnership in terms of what it does for David and what it does for Johnny. Last night in the car talking with, with Sandra and Johnny, asking Sandra how Johnny's doing, and, and Sandra said about how she feels that he's been so helped, uh, so much life given to him because of his partnership with us. That, that's, that's the kind of story I like to hear. That's great. I hope you feel some of that at the foundation and, and the way churches. And, and also feel that what, something of what you're able to contribute. And again, we said that even this morning, the fact that we're doing this, the fact that David has made this happen. It's a beautiful thing. And, and those of you who are not from foundation or the way, I assume that you wouldn't be here today if you didn't feel something of this, what I feel this desire for genuine partnership, which really is life-giving and so helpful for us and full of joy. And, and I'd urge you to find it and to lean into it. And if, you, if that means you want to explore partnership with us in advance, well, praise God, I'd love to talk with you some more. If it means you're going to find it better elsewhere, well, that's great as well. But 
Don't be on your own. Don't be on, in splendid isolation. It is not good for the man to be alone. We need to be in partnership. Now, uh, I've described something of my personal journey back to my dad's story in the 70s. What, what does partnership mean for me now? 27 years into full-time ministry, what does partnership mean for me? <clears throat> it means that I have friends around the world. That Actually, some of my best friends are people who live in other continents. And I have this great joy of knowing I could go anywhere in the world, pretty much, and I could find people who I've got genuine friendship with. It means that I'm, I am lifted into a bigger world and a bigger vision than would otherwise be the case. Our local church ministry can become very introspective. It can get very shrunk down. We're very busy and just focus on the, the local. And to have a regular reminder that we're part of something bigger, that, that is good for me and it's good for my church. It lifts our vision beyond just us and our issues and our challenges and our problems to see the grandeur of what God is doing and building his kingdom around the world. Helps lift us, helps lift me, helps lift my church out of introspection. It also gives me a sense of security because I know that there are people who are looking out for me. And of course that starts in my church, that's where it should be, that my brother elders look out for me and the other structures we have and the team we have and all that. Friends in the local church is so crucial. But I know that I've got friends in this partnership who are looking out for me as well. And there's a real security for me and actually a security for our church in that. Because if things were going wrong with me, there are friends outside the church who the guys in my church could call on for help to deal with me and help sort things out. And there's also a challenge, which is good, a challenge to think about what hills are we looking to take. That I want my church to be faithful in the mission God has called us to in Bournemouth and Paul, but actually believe God has called us to a bigger mission to go to the ends of the earth. And being in a partnership with other churches around the world helps to focus that challenge, that mission that God has called us to. And so being part of this thing for me is joy-filled and life-giving and mission-shaping and introspection-busting. It does me and my church good and I think that me and my church are able by God's grace to do others good at times as well. And it's a beautiful thing. At times, yeah, at times it's demanding at times there's bumps in the roads, of course there are. But I'm utterly convinced, biblically and through now pretty long experience, that genuine partnership is essential for healthy church life, making healthy disciples and pursuing the mission of God. Uh, think of what Paul says here to the Philippians. Uh, my joy, my joy, my joy, because of your partnership in the gospel. That's what we're committed to. Oh, that's helpful. A little bit of taste of advance. Let us pray. Well, thank you. Thank you that we can be here this morning. I pray, Lord, that as some of us are already committed into these kind of partnerships and others are exploring, I ask that you help each of us in this room to, to press into all that you have for us. I pray that uh, we wouldn't miss the, 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 the bigness of what is ours in Christ Jesus. Mm. Well, thank you. You have given us work to do and thank you that it will be completed in the day of Christ. And thank you that we don't have to do that on our own, not just battling away on our own, but together with brothers and sisters you call us into partnership with, we're able to lean into the mission you've called us to and trust you for much fruit and much grace. So I pray that we would know more of that as a consequence of being here in this place today, King Jesus. In your name I ask it. Amen. Amen.